Hello. I'm Barbara Ray Holcomb, and I'm responsible for coordinating events such as this, the ASL Lecture Series. So I don't want to go on and on myself. I'd rather uh, turn the tables back over to Patty Durr, and she will be giving the formal introduction to our guest speaker this afternoon. So Patty, I turn it over to you. Hello. Wow, I'm so happy to be here. I want to tell you just a little bit about how I made the acquaintance of Dr. Kanama. Uh, every two years, there is a, uh, a conference out in Utah, and they take turns having very important keynote speakers come and present to the group. So I went. I've gone a couple of times before without knowing who would be the speaker. Sometimes they announce the speakers, and sometimes they don't. So I saw that Professor Konoma was going to be there. And uh, he was in California, I think, four years ago. He was brought to present there. And he gave such an amazing presentation. I'd heard about it, but I hadn't seen it for myself. So I flew out to Utah for the uh, conference last year. And I was blown away. The man is just a font of intelligence and uh, academic uh, information. So uh, he's given different presentations, whatever. He's written books. I, I read the book myself. And I couldn't help myself. I had to ask him to come here to present to us today. So uh, anyway, I was able to uh, bring him. And there's different sponsors that made today possible to bring Dr. Konoma here. First and foremost, foremost ASLIE. Uh, the Department of American Sign Language, what am I forgetting here? Interpreting Education, American Sign Language and Interpreter Education, and the Department of Cultural and Creative Studies also, which is my home department. And uh, we also have a federal grant where we were able to garner the funds that also helped us bring him here, and also the uh, President's Office of NTID. Now, he has a lot of uh, varied background. His degree was gotten from, let me think if I remember this, I'm a little confused. I believe it was the University, no, the College of Dublin. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of Dublin and Ireland and the signs for that. There'll be some interesting sign infusions today. This is Dublin. That's a sign for Dublin. Okay, a little different from our sign. <laughs> and a little fraught with meaning. And this is the sign for uh, Ireland. All right. He received his bachelor's degree in policy, social policy, excuse me. And then he continued for his uh, uh, higher degree, his master's degree from Trinity College in Dublin. And, then, and also, which was in association with, uni with uh, University College in Dublin. And then he also works for the, works for the Center of Deaf Studies. I want to, in the beginning, thank you for uh, being patient with my ASL. Uh, and I do have uh, interpreters working with me and also uh, a gentleman named Guillaume, I'm not sure of his last name. He's going to be helping me out with um, providing me with ASL signs if I need them. Now, please understand, ASL is my fourth language. And this presentation is, is quite a, uh, a heavy uh, representation of part of my dissertation, you know, that um, I had to go to uh, Dublin University and, um, and provide them with my dissertation. I will have some, uh, I will provide this, uh, this presentation in Irish Sign Language when I return as well, so it'll be accessible that way. Now, my topic today is um, a little bit heavy about equality, and so I'm going to provide as much of the information as I can, but I will also provide copies of the PowerPoint so that you can read and reflect on it at your leisure. In terms of the structure of the presentation, uh, I want to make sure that you enjoy it and also that you understand it. I, I definitely don't want you to be sitting here and looking like you're having a great time, but really not understanding the content. So really, the, the, the point here is the message that I have to give to you. And so please let me know um, if you're not understanding at any point. This is the structure of today, our agenda for today. Um, we will go through each one of these points. First, I'll give you a little background of uh, why I decided to research this particular topic. 
and then I'll talk about signed languages and their relation with, to equality. Now you notice that I used the word signed with ED on the end. That was my personal decision. You could call it a political decision um, because I, if I contrast sign language with spoken language, you know, the proper English word is spoken. If I had used sign language, um, I felt as though it would sort of put sign language in an inferior position when juxtaposed with the concept of spoken language. Um, so that is why I made that, uh, that change, and I'm going to refer to it as signed languages. Um, again, I'm saying please, uh, we're, we're, we're also going to look at a critique of the ideas. I'm going to be explaining the framework of equality. Uh, I want to make sure that's the right sign. Yes, I'm going to look, look at a framework of, of equality, and I'm going to talk about how the discussion on a theoretical level can be actually operationalized uh, in, in an everyday context. And then I'm going to apply this framework to the status of sign languages. And, and what I want to do is sort of overlay this framework onto the discussion of sign languages in terms of their equality and their role in, in uh, achieving equality for deaf people. Um, and and I am, I'm very open for discussion. Uh, the reason I, I propose these ideas is to uh, pursue academic debate with you. Um, <laughs> And this was uh, the subject of my dissertation, and I did get my PhD, so I was successful in the endeavor. And lastly, I want to talk about the equality of condition, which I will shorten and refer to as EOC. I'll explain to you more about what that means later, and then I, uh, when I say EOC, you will know that I'm referring to this idea of equality of condition. And so we'll explore that in some depth later. And also, there is a book that I relied on heavily. Uh, it's, it's not exactly bedtime reading, I'll tell you, because it, it, it's, uh, it, you'd really need a dictionary in order to make it through this particular book. It's very heavy. Um, it's written by four hearing people and who taught me a great deal. And at the same time, I was able to teach them a great deal as well about uh, sign language and deaf culture. So it was an, a very rich experience for me. A brief word on my background. Uh, I did receive a PhD. I did uh, do original research, which I, it took me six years to complete. I worked on it part-time because I also needed to uh, earn a living, and so I sort of had to go back and forth. Uh, and then at the end of six years, uh, in the last years, I did uh, work on the dissertation full-time. It, it was extremely uh, complicated, however, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And um, it, I learned a great deal from that, and now I feel like I, it's incumbent on me to come and spread the word and, and, and bring this to the public. Uh, now, I did look at Finnish Sign Language and Irish Sign Language, and I looked at that from a frame of in egalitarian analysis of language policies and their effects on deaf people. And the reason I picked the country of Finland to study, well, you know that uh, it's long been touted as one of the leaders, uh, one of the best models for rights of uh, deaf people, recognition of sign language, and so forth. So I thought Finland would be a good country to study. Um, and so that's a subject for a whole other uh, presentation, uh, Finland and its policies on deafness. But uh, this was my hypothesis. Uh, I spelled this. I want to make sure I spell it correctly in ASL. This was my hypothesis for my... Ah, see, this is my H. Okay. This was my hypothesis for my dissertation. Uh, you know, the, the social modi, model of disability is, is often um, used for uh, promoting deaf access and deaf causes, but um, I felt as though... Uh, you know, film and media and so forth uh, 
don't provide the kind of recognition of, uh, of language, sign language as a language, the recognition and celebration of deaf culture. I felt as though uh, that model of disability has not uh, advanced our cause. And so, again, for another time, we can talk about this more. Now, the reason that I picked uh, signed language to study in and how sign languages, the recognition of them is, re is related to equality, uh, in my research I found that um, Patty Ladd's book on deafness uh, talked about the history of sign language and, and again and again mentioned the idea of equality and parity and that equality, that word equality appeared uh, for many years in literature, but I wanted to see for myself what whether equality had been achieved. I mean, it, w it was bandied about for years, but I wanted to see whether there was true equality uh, advances for deaf people. Now, the World Federation of the Deaf, which we abbreviate WFD, um, which is, is a, a, a international organization for the deaf. In 1991, uh, sorry, I just, as an aside, I need to tell you, I, I haven't practiced my numbers in ASL, so I'll, I'll use these numbers. In 1991, the World Federation of the Deaf, at their meeting, passed a, a resolution to uh, send their delegates back to their home countries and to advocate for legislative recognition of sign language. Now, this was in 1991. And uh, the World Federation for the Deaf um, really needed to make sure that there was legislative recognition of sign language in those countries. And again, uh, there was nothing mentioned about equality for deaf people, but this was their way of approaching that. Now, you know, the World Federation of the Deaf, um, uh, there's a, uh, the European Union of the Deaf, uh, you know, is a, is a group of independent countries, um, and they met with the European Parliament and passed resolutions. I want to make sure that sounds right. So the parla Parliament of, of the European Union uh, debated whether uh, they should actually uh, take action on the request by the WFD to pass two re resolutions regarding um, deaf rights. And so the uh, European Union did pass two resolutions, one in 1988 and one in 1999. And then also um, in Brussels, there was a, a, an announcement. I think the, there was an official statement um, and member countries signed this statement in, I think, 2000, and, oh, there were 27 countries, oh, no, I'm sorry, 30. There were 30 uh, countries. You know, there are 51 countries altogether in Europe, um, all over the place on the map, and so 30 of those countries signed this agreement. Um, but it was a rather weak re resolution, uh, used language like uh, will, hope for, and that sort of thing. Now. The National Deaf Associations were asked to um, become partners in this effort. And so I, you can look on their website, like for example, the National Association of the Deaf. And so I looked at various associations uh, of the deaf, Australia, uh, United States and so forth, looking for uh, where in in their um, country's legislation this idea of rights for deaf people uh, had appeared. So when I looked at the NADA's website, I saw that uh, there was something in there that talked about we believe in equality, dignity, and justice for all, all deaf and hard of hearing Americans. But uh, that was it. Uh, there, and, and I felt like we needed to go further than that. Um, and you know uh, the idea of deafhood, this concept has uh, just spread worldwide now and it has, international, and it has 
and we, we see this uh, all, all over the place in, on the internet, and we have discussions about it. This, this concept has spread all over the world. So if, if you look at this, you see that there's one crucial concept. You see, you see the words that are underlined here? Because I wanted to see how often equality was mentioned. So you see that in the context of deafhood, there is a direct connection made to equality. The framework of deafhood, the concept of deafhood, will really support and advance our fight for equality. I don't know. It depends on whether we're fast learners, slow learners, whether we will use this idea to, to advance our cause. But that's the idea, is to use this concept to further the status of deaf people in the world. Now, I'd like to talk about language policy. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a, a, just a, an abbreviated version of my take on this. Well, first of all, I have to say that um, it is extremely difficult to get any kind of consensus on what language policy is or should be. Everyone has their own opinion. Uh, there is literature, shelves and shelves of literature about it. There isn't any <laughs> one particular book that says this is the uh, perfect uh, example of language policy. In fact, as I did my uh, search of the literature, I found that uh, the policies were contradicting each other. And uh, so I didn't find one overarching wisdom to um, lead us in the development of language policy. And of course, that it's practically a, a living entity. Uh, it's hard to pin down. It's hard to actually uh, grab it and study it for any length of time. So uh, this is a good picture of me looking in the box that represents language policy. And uh, people all over the world in all universities have do been doing the same thing, um, writing volumes about uh, what language policy should be, the most successful language policy, that, and because everyone's looking for the magic bullet that they can apply to their own countries and their own languages. Um, but of course, that's sort of the human experience, isn't it? It's hard to boil down uh, what is best for human beings into one sentence, especially in terms of language policy. So I'll, I will tell you that uh, w really there is no one um, consensus on what language policy should be. And so instead of that, I'll just use the concept of framework. Now, and, and the reason that this is so difficult to tackle is because, well, let's start with the word policy itself. That in itself is an extremely complicated concept. It, it's very difficult to come to an agreement on, on what policy means. Uh, you could spend all day talking about uh, policy. Uh, but then, if you add the word language to this concept, oh, that would take years and years and years, uh, and you probably would never come to any kind of an agreement about what language policy ought to entail. Now, the fact that policies are, are very complicated entities. Um, in fact, about 90% of the policies, um, if you ask people what, what a policy is, mostly people will say, well, it's, it's a group of rules. It's a, it's a formalized codification of rules. It's, it's telling us what we should do or think. Uh, but actually, policy entails much more than that. Um, it, is shaped by attitude. It has to do with economic systems. It, uh, it talks about rules. And so it becomes even more confusing. You need to know that policies can be established by default. Uh, whatever, uh, the, the absence of a decision is de facto a policy. For example, if, you're, if you don't have a policy on language, you've never even thought about what, uh, what a language policy should be, 
you have in fact already made a decision by, by, by virtue of the fact that you haven't even discussed it because you've labeled it as unimportant and that has uh, policy uh, ramifications. So we've seen this, uh, we've seen that often policy is formed by just the um, allowing status quo to continue. And uh, it says up here, no decision is policy. Um, let me expand on that a little bit. The idea of, of no decision um, could be uh, partly uh, the result of people s claiming that there's no time for discussion or uh, saying that the, the policy discussion will happen but at a later date, that the time isn't just right. It's not quite on the agenda yet, but we will put it on our agenda. So, And also that the time isn't quite right. Really, we shouldn't bring up that particular thing at, at this time. So, so this idea of perpetuating the status quo and waiting uh, ad nauseum for policy to be formed, which you all know happens, is in effect a de facto policy itself. So, but for this presentation, I'm going to concentrate on the province of language policy and, and the framework uh, that can be applied to language policies to understand uh, its role in the advancement of rights. Now, if you look in countries around the world, and maybe America does this as well, um, I'm not entirely 100% um, versed in your, um, your opinion of this in America, but you know that um, another thing that affects policy is the fact that uh, there are uh, government ed agencies, there are different levels of government, there are bureaucracies and so forth uh, that are set up to enforce policies. And so we do see that sign language does appear in the legislation in some people, in, in some uh, way. And, uh, but my question is, does this really advance the equality of deaf people in society? And I've done a, a great deal of investigation and I can tell you that the results that I have found is that no. Even though language policy may appear in legislation, there hasn't been uh, real advancement. This is an example of a committee that's meeting to discuss some sort of policy, which will have great effect on your life. And look, there, it's all mostly white people and maybe one token black representative committee. This is an icon of uh, policymakers at work. Now, we are going to come back to the idea of quality, but first I want to talk a little bit about uh, the current status of signed languages around the world. It is true that signed languages do appear in legislation, in constitutions, but however, only on a superficial level that, that doesn't lead to much uh, action. Um, there are, uh, you know, Ireland, uh, my country, uh, has a TV program that is uh, that is for deaf people, and um, I saw on this television program um, this idea that 44 national sign languages have gained legal or official recognition around the world. I'm sorry, what? What? Am I using the right sign? Recognition? Okay. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. I see. Um, I see the way I was signing it made it look like it was not allowed. So I, I but if I, ah, if I sign it the way I was signing it, it means uh, something that is prohibited or not allowed. So I will use your sign for law. That is what I was intending to say. So there are 44 countries around the world who have laws that uh, mention signed languages. So that's what this TV program told me is that there are 44 countries that have national sign languages. And so I got on the internet, and uh, thank you, uh, the, the website of the WFD, and that website said that there were 27 countries that uh, mentioned deaf people in, in legislation. But again, um, the fact that it's mentioned in legislation doesn't necessarily mean that there are um, there are implications to people's everyday lives. Now, um, I'm, I'm 
just starting out with this, this is my thesis. I'm possibly the only researcher on this, so I, I welcome more analysis uh, by other scholars into, uh, so that we can make sure of the facts as they stand today. Okay, so there are various forms of legal recognition of sign language. Uh, some sign languages have constitutional status where, where written right into the Constitution is uh, something about sign language. Now, only a, a small number of countries have anything like that at, a, at the constitutional level. Other countries um, grant legislative status to sign languages. Their uh, congresses or par parliament um, granted some mention of sign language. Sweden has a constitutional reference, but uh, not, but not in the constitution, in 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 a law, a piece of legislation that relates to education. And Portugal. Um, I want to make sure I'm doing that sign correctly because that's how they sign it. Um, Portugal has uh, has right at right at the top of their constitution there it, there is language that uh, refers to this. But for example, Sweden in the um, Education Act, which is their law, that's where sign language. Um, makes an appearance, but it's talking about uh, sign language uh, for children in school and so forth. But, but the law is very weak in Sweden, whereas in Portugal, the law is extremely powerful. Um, it, it talks about, uh, it, the tables are turned in the Portuguese law. It doesn't talk about um, interpreters and services and so forth. Um, it, it, it is a much stronger statement of language rights and, and uh, let's see, oh, example. I, I'm only thinking of my sign for example because it's like you hold something up. Um, okay. So uh, I know that some, some of the legislative recognition is merely symbolic. Um, there really is no, no power to the law. There is no requirement for action. Now, deaf people have come a long way. And we know that associations for the, of the deaf have been fighting for years to gain equality. Uh, and many deaf people have had serious discussions about um, the fact that uh, recognition of sign language is the best way to gain uh, equality in the greater society, um, as opposed to focusing on hearing status, that language rights, cultural rights, uh, and experiences are the best way to win this struggle. But when I look around, I don't see much success in that arena. So my question is, uh, are, are language, uh, sign language recognition in, in legislature and in constitutions, are they sufficient to advance equality? And I would say no. And obviously you know as well as I do, and this is, this is painfully obvious, that, that not enough has been done. And so I want to talk about how we respond to this condition that we're in right now. As I looked at other countries and their status of equality for deaf people, uh, I, I didn't see it. Uh, I saw some mention in, in legislative recognition, but uh, I would say that, that, that there have been some gains to these uh, recognitions. For example, um, the deaf community feels a sense of pride, feels as though finally their language and culture has been recognized, but did it lead to equality? I don't think so. Now, I'm not saying that the establishment of uh, pride in the community is, is, should be minimized because that, I believe, is a first step towards achieving true equality. Um, but pride in and of itself 
is not enough to make an impact on people's lives. And so pride is just what I would call a, a first step towards equality. It, it is one in a number of steps that we need to take to achieve true equality. Now, in terms of the law, sign language has been recognized in the law. And this has made deaf people um, thrilled. But if a deaf person takes a case to court in order to see that the law is enforced, we see the deaf person losing the case time and time again. Why? Because the mention of sign language and deaf rights was merely symbolic, and the law was weak and ineffectual. And so it really did nothing to advance the rights of deaf people. And we find ourselves uh, the victims of just the perpetuation of the status quo time after time, even though in the law it appears that we've made some progress. Now, as far as education goes, um, all right, I, I, I saw uh, in Utah, I saw bilingual. Is this how you sign bilingual? I've seen a couple of different signs of bilingual. I can't remember. Uh, in California, I saw, and, and uh, in my country, we, we we sign it a different way. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you maybe in New York you have a different sign. I don't want to step on anyone's toes here, and I don't want uh, anyone to say that crazy Irish guy didn't know. Uh, bilingual. Okay, maybe that's another way to sign it. But anyway, um, program educational programs that are bilingual appear to be uh, in name only. If you look at what's actually happening in the classroom. If you see what the teacher is doing, uh, there's a, a plethora of excuses made about why their sign language is not at a level it should be. Uh, they say, well, I'm working on it, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm taking lessons, I'm practicing, um, I'm signing, but I'm signing in English word order. Uh, but you know the word in English, should? That is a rather soft term. Um, and what it implies is, well, if everybody can agree on this, then we'll go ahead and follow this proscription. But, uh, but the language of should doesn't require any particular action whatsoever. And the people who put it in the law that way are very aware of all this. And it was a deliberate strategy um, to, to uh, make the law uh, more flexible. And if we look at socioeconomic status of deaf people, uh, there have been some individual successes, and we all know them, but those are on an individual level. If we look at the deaf community as a, as a group, we don't see the kinds of uh, advancements in the community. Um, and it's wonderful that we, we have a growing sense of the deaf community and deaf culture. Um, I think there, there's a children's book that I was reading, um, and it talked about uh, the history of America, and you know how um, African Americans were enslaved in America. And I think uh, on, the, on the television news, uh, finally, when, it, when the first black person appeared as a newscaster on, on television, does that mean that the entire community of African Americans had made strides and had achieved some measure of equality? No, it was an example of one person's success story. Um, and the same is true for the deaf community. We, we see examples of individuals who have been successful. But, uh, so I see parallels in the, in the uh, African American community as well. Now, you know, I'm, I could be uh, touted as one of those success stories. I have a, a PhD, but, but am I indicative of what is happening in the deaf community as a whole? Absolutely not. Members of the deaf community are going through constant struggles on a daily basis, uh, but, but people who have been successful are sort of pulled to the forefront and shown off as examples of the progress we've made. But I'm telling you, it's an individualized type of success. You know, our culture stresses 
individualism and not the collectivism the, and the, what is good for society in general. So that's part of what is going on here. Now, you, we see that constitutional recognitions of sign language, for example, in Finland, um, you know, Finnish language, uh, I, I need a translation, of course, so, um, a translation, right. So uh, I didn't read their constitution in Finnish, I got a translation into English, um, because I, I'm, I don't read Finnish. Uh, the, the, the grammar rules are extraordinarily difficult to learn and much, much harder to learn than English. So, uh, but that's yet again another discussion. So uh, I, I looked for the presence of deaf people, deaf rights in, in the Constitution and I found that uh, is the word official uh, and what I, what I got was an official translation of the Constitution and um, there was a recognition of sign language in the Constitution but only in terms of people who are not able to hear in other words disability uh, rights this is my sign in Ireland for disability so Sign language is only mentioned in the context of disability. And, and this obviously uh, implies that sign language is not seen as a bona fide language. Oh, I think a ghost just uh, fast forwarded this computer here. Now, New Zealand. Um, officially recognized, legally recognized New Zealand Sign Language, but, uh, and, and this is uh, quoting Reffel and McKee, ah, she said, McKee is deaf, so um, these, uh, so uh, I'm accepting uh, their word on this. Um, they pointed out that the Maori community in um, Finland, which is like Native American community here, um, they have a language, and it seems that in the Finnish constitution, the recognition, excuse me, in the New Zealand constitution, the recognition is more powerful for the Maori Aboriginal language than it is for sign language. And again, we see the language of should, shall, and so forth, or should not. But nowhere does this appear in the Bill of Rights for the country. So sign language was, was always uh, in an inferior position to other languages that were recognized within the country. Uh, always uh, given inferior status as a language. And uh, Turner is a hearing man. This is his sign. Um, he is a, uh, he's Scottish. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure what your sign is. Uh, it might be the sign for the bagpipes. He, um, he has researched BSL, and his conclusion is that laws related to sign language in, in the United Kingdom are absolutely toothless. There is recognition in name, but in terms of the conditions of uh, re respect and, um, and, and uh, recognition for the language and the rights of deaf people, uh, there is no mandate whatsoever. Now in Sweden, um, you know, in uh, these Scandinavian countries, Sweden and Denmark and so forth, there is a strong um, mandate to respect individual rights. 
And now the deaf community is afraid that this will be, um, this, this will be, become dissolute because the uh, cochlear implants have um, become so widespread and have been given out for free by these governments that they're afraid that, uh, that the idea of deaf community and deaf culture will just sort of disappear. You know, doctors, uh, when they find out that um, a child is deaf, they counsel the parents um, to uh, implant their children. And then if the implant is not successful, then the doctor advises the uh, parents to learn sign language as a fallback strategy. Now my wish is that the doctor would say, first and foremost, you really need to learn sign language in order to be able to communicate with your uh, son or daughter throughout their life. So the fact that it's delegated to a sort of a last resort strategy is very depressing for me, but I'm hoping, I don't want to sound too negative here, but I'm hoping that um, we'll see some change and we'll get into the realm of the positive before too long. And you know that uh, even here and in Canada, um, a lot of research has done, been done on disability law uh, and there, is, there are laws pertaining to education, um, and, but in terms of right, language rights and so forth, uh, the legislation is consistently weak and, and not requiring of any ac action. And uh, so I have yet to find evidence of, um, of any laws in these countries that have any real effect. Now, in Ireland, we have laws pertaining to equality. We have uh, nine of them, and we call them grounds. Uh, and they consist of uh, religious freedoms, um, uh, religious rights that you, uh, you're not allowed to oppress people with regard to those things, um, racial uh, oppression for any reason. All of these things are forbidden. Um, and uh, age discrimination or oppression of uh, people on the basis of age are strictly forbidden, but sign language is not mentioned in these things. And so there's really no legal recourse to uh, getting the services necessary or accommodations at the workplace or so forth. Um, and so if a deaf person says that they want an interpreter, uh, to be able to, uh, and it's my right to be able to do that in the uh, in the workplace. They're told, well, no. I mean, you're you're classed with uh, other disabled people, and and there's nothing in there that requires us to provide uh, language rights for you. Basically, that's just one example. So I have to think that in all these cases that I've investigated all over the world and in my uh, comparison of Finland and um, Irish Sign Language and the treatment of it in the legal system, I came to the conclusion that legally recognized sign languages are often excluded from, from language policies because they are consistently lumped in with other um, disability issues. And if you um, want to get an interpreter for something or something related to your right to your own language, you have to go to disability services to get that sort of thing. All services, uh, are, are relegated to the, uh, the framework of related to disabilities. And so why is it like this? You know, deaf people have struggled for years and continue to be hopeful about the future and understand that uh, they've been promised a number of things and told that this, this will all happen. But it seems to me that 
This is lip service. This is uh, something that has been placed in the legislation in order to pacify deaf people. And, uh, and it really is not doing justice to what, what their request is. The other thing we hear all the time is that it's just not pragmatic for us to write all these things into the laws because, you know, deaf people, that's a small community and um, we, we are working towards greater acceptance of deaf people in the deaf community in the future, but you know, it's going to take time and you, you have to think about the practicality of all that it will take to achieve it because, uh, and you need to, Sometimes you need to take a rather circuitous route in order to achieve your agenda, but just hold on because you'll get there. And then the other argument that we hear is, well, this is just a transitional phase. This is where we are now, um, but we can get there later. And, and the problem is that we're not using a framework of equality and applying it to language policy. And, and, and many times I see this expression of it will happen in the future and it just makes me crazy. Um, and you know, life is short and we don't have the time to wait hoping and praying that someday these things will come true. And, and I know that the, the same thing is true for other groups of people as well, but what, what deaf people need to say is that we, we can't wait forever, we can't continue forever in this transitional phase. Now, Jokinen, uh, who is the president of the World Federation of the Deaf, he went and appeared before the United Nations um, in, in their group that studies minority rights. And he argued that that language rights should be extended to the deaf community to sign language. But, of course, he got the same old answers. Well, we're not sure that we have the funds. Uh, that's a small community. We can't use the money that we have to advocate for the language rights of minorities. Uh, we can't apply that to the deaf community at this time. So the exclusion of language policies is a serious problem that we do see, and we're ready to rem remedy and rectify that situation any way we can. Now, for many of you, um, hearing and deaf, uh, perhaps you think that, of course, this makes sense, that it should be under the rubric of disabilities and that framework. That's where there's some money. That's where we can get resources. What's the complaint? Um, maybe we can get enough rights just by going through that. But if you look from a cultural perspective and a linguistic expect, uh, perspective and the way people grow up and their experiences, you find that this is not the way to go and it's not quite satisfying to be put in that particular window. Um, maybe not, maybe some people feel that's fine, maybe I, you might feel that I'm wrong to even bring this complaint up, but for me it devalues sign languages, signed languages. So. You know, some people think it's a perfectly normal thing to do, that it's under the umbrella of disability, and let it be. It makes a lot of sense to folks. And these things are very hard to undo and to rectify because the mindset, the paradigm is so strongly entrenched. So as I've been analyzing all of the details of this, I've seen that a lot of people do accept this and uh, a lot of the attitude prevailing is that there's a compensatory tool being used, compensatory tool, that sign language itself is a compensatory tool, that it's used in lieu of other things that we wish they had, but if they can't have that, then we'll give them sign language and we'll recognize it. There was a previous discussion uh, about sign language, rights, communication as a tool. Sign language used as a tool, am I signing that correctly? Okay, sign language as a tool. All right. Instead of looked at as a real bona fide language for communication. So we need to change that framework. Oops. We need to look at 
the way it's looked at as a compensatory. I'm sorry, I'm having so much trouble with spelling today. The change the idea of it being a compensatory tool. So I want to give you examples of what exactly I mean by that terminology. There's a lot of evidence that it actually is the correct word to use. So a lot of people do just accept the attitude like, oh, okay, sign, you're deaf, you can't read, you can't hear, you can't speak, and so, sure, because you don't have those particular capabilities, then you might as well sign. If a child's born to deaf parents and they have sign language first, they're doing fine, but if they have a child who's hearing, then what's their compensatory tool? It's very important that we look at the impact. Am I signing this correctly? Th we look at the impact, the implications of an attitude such as this. When one sees that sign language is offered as an option instead of a right, that sets the particular attitudinal barriers and its particular mindset that is prevalent. And this is among hearing and deaf people, mind you. Uh, and a lot of people may disagree with me, but it really gives me chills sometimes when I see somebody saying, oh, this person can't have an interpreter, or they can't, or the deaf person needs the interpreter. They need the interpreter as if nobody else in the room needs the interpreter to communicate with the deaf person. We need to change that view and see everybody as allies and everybody within the communication environment being of a piece. There's also a prevalent attitude that it's sort of like having speech therapy. Speech therapy, it's something that sort of helps bring a child or bring a person up to the parity or the level of the hearing people, uh, like psychological counseling. It helps people, it's a compensatory tool, it's something that's tolerated and supported, but not something that garners respect in its own right. Sometimes sign language looked at as a service, as an option, as a, a backup system, a plan B. Oh, if they don't understand speech reading or they really can't optimize you know, oral training, then um, I guess what we'll have to do is give them sign language. It's not looked at as a right. It's looked at as something secondary. And a lot of people also say, well, if they can't do well with speech reading, if they can't do well with everything else that we've thrown at them, then fine, sign language, well, I guess that's all right. And I don't necessarily see that happening so much in America, but I do see that in, uh, in other countries. And that seems to be the mindset that's very strongly entrenched within people. And again, it's a compensatory tool. We need to stress that. And instead of that, we need to look at it as something that garners respect in its own right. And so these attitudes that I just described and all the examples that I've just given you basically lead to the fact that deaf people are treated as less than, as inferior to. And what we're hoping is that the attitude can be ameliorated and that basically that parity is achieved. But obviously, from what I've seen and all the evidence that I've been able to gather, this is not happening as of yet. So a consequence, the consequences, thank you for that sign, the consequences of everything that I've described here too far is that sign languages are tolerated, they're not celebrated. Celebrated, is that the right sign? They're not celebrated, they're tolerated. Oh, all right, I'm so sorry for you. Well, okay, if that's what you gotta use, it sure is pretty. But it's not celebrated as, an, as a, a distinct and beautiful entity in its own right. In Australia, uh, Branson and Miller had done research and found that uh, if sign language is not 
given its full due, then basically humanity cannot be fulfilled. And this statement is really chilling if you think about the implications. A person cannot be fully, completely satisfied as a human being without having their linguistic rights respected and promulgated. So another idea is that sign, signed languages are treated as non-aligned. Oh, look at my hands, I'm a bollocks up. But they're not treated, they're not treated as, as a true language. They're treated as a non-aligned language. And so it keeps the trajectory of their importance and their promulgation and their celebration uh, on a slower pace than it could be. There's fits and starts to people feeling stronger and more pride in being able to garner their rights instead of a, a uh, taking off or a trajectory of them being able to get what's, what's truthfully and honorably theirs. Now, I know that a lot of people say, okay, signed languages. They don't necessarily say American sign language. They might just say sign language, and they don't necessarily take that pride in what the language is for their nationality or whatever. If you say, if you see a sign and it says this performance or this event will be interpreted, it doesn't say what particular language, it says in sign language. And I feel it's important to recognize what particular language, what particular signed language will be used in a certain context. I feel that that helps give value, that gives pride and instills that sense of uniqueness to that particular environment and to that particular kind of signed language, such as ASL, and I use Irish sign language, something that I'm very proud with. But when you actually name the name of and give the word to the particular kind of sign language, then it also reinforces the fact that we have value, we have culture, and therefore it gives us a certain respect that just giving a generic thing of sign language does not necessarily instill. Now let's talk finally about equality and the framework that I promised you in the beginning that I'd be providing to you today. Let's explain the framework a little bit more. I really, really think these authors are amazing. They taught so much to me when I was studying under them. And I've extrapolated their works and put it uh, onto my particular research with signed languages. So everybody good so far? UCD, University College in Dublin, where I went to school, has an Equality Studies Center. And it has a multidisciplinary framework. It looks in terms of laws, economics, political policies. It goes across the board and brings them all together. It is a wonderful way to holistically look at all of these issues, and it's all subsumed within one department. So it's a very rich and flowing department with a lot of um, context that it uh, explores. You look at philosophy, legal implications, morality, and basically they fit all of these different sorts of uh, disciplines into um, a particular framework and then sees how these theories can be put into everyday practice. They take us from the theoretical realm into the application. What's the sign for a gold? Gold? Okay, gold. Okay, thank you. Oh, gold, that makes sense. I get it why that's the sign. Like California, right? Okay, so you know the golden rule, right? With a rule that everybody breaks, right? Uh, you know, and that it doesn't mean that everybody has to be homogenous, right? If you say the equality, does that mean we all have the same cars? We all have the same houses? No. It means that's an acceptance of these diverse ways of being in the world. It means recognition. It means mutual respect. That's what equality truly means. And it's a very, very important concept to keep in mind because sometimes people are even afraid of the word equality and feel that the homogeneity that it would um, encompass is, is a, a demeaning thing and a negative thing. But truly, it encompasses all aspects of diversity. So when we use this framework, it's based very simply on three questions. It seems simple, but it's actually much harder than it appears. It's deceptive. One is that you must ask the question, who is the equality between? Between whom? Black and white? Between a woman and a man? Between Americans and Canadians? 
Who are the entities that we're comparing and that we're determining whether they're equal or not? Equality of what? What's the sign for what? I did wear instead of what? Equality of what? Is it an economic disparity? Are we looking at resources, material goods? What's the measure of the equality that we're using when we look at two entities and determining um, whether they have parity or not? And most important of all, and often overlooked, I believe, is what type of relationship, especially in terms of the realm of power. Often, when you look, it, it's very difficult to see this. It's a covert kind of thing that's going on that people aren't necessarily privy to. But when looked very, very much closer, um, and you examine it, you see that usually there's a power disparity. And those are the types of relationships that we look at. So again, to the framework and the three levels, if you look at the most basic level of equality, and that's it, basically it's considered the second one, the first one is basic equality, the second is liberal egalitarianism. Now when we look at basic equality, that means that basically everybody has rights, their due respect, and they have intrinsic value, they have worth intrinsic worth, and it's all the same. You know the United Nations, you're all familiar with that. They have a Human Rights Commission. And the Human Rights Commission basically says that uh, everybody is free to express their opinions, free to have worship, free to have any sorts of things that we basically find in a kind of con constitution. Those are basic rights. Liberal egalitarianism takes that several steps further. Now, liberalism, which is a higher level of equality, more than basic, as we said. Liberalism. Uh, it's, people are often quite confused with it because there's quite a spectrum uh, within the realm of liberalism. There's classical liberalism. And basically that comes from English common law from you know 700 years ago, from way, way, way back. And you can look at the spectrum of how it's evolved over the years. There's neoliberalism, uh, and that basically looks at the importance of, of, of economics. But they all have a similar point, which is that we look at individual rights and freedoms as the most valuable and important measure of our lives. It takes it on an individual and not a collective level. That's an important difference. For example, if you look to Australia and the deaf community there, if you have a couple of sweethearts, a deaf person and a hearing person, and they give birth, now this is a true story, there was a deaf person and a hearing person who had a baby girl, and then for one reason or another, the marriage was dissolved. The hearing partner who had custody of the child decided to implant the child and the father, who I believe was deaf, was very angry, decided to take it to a court case, explain the necessity of their culture, the community, sign language, all the things that we know of. And what did the judge say? Hmm, that sounds fine, but let me just take a moment here to consult with the books and look at individual rights and what we say here in Australia. And they determined that the girl should have the cochlear implant because it wasn't a matter of community rights. It was a matter of what they deemed to be important for the individual, and they ascertained that the cochlear implant was the particular way to go. And this tends to be the way in the Western cultures, um, Western Europe somewhat too, uh, America and Canada and Western Europe. It uh, takes a lot of discussion and a lot of time to understand, and we could go on and on about it, but that tends to be the viewpoint as the individual takes precedence. So we look at all countries in the world and we see there's disparity. Unfortunately, not everything is the same and not everybody is equal. And so we're trying to find a way as, as, what, well, as much as possible to be able to bring uh, the countries that aren't necessarily respecting and uh, valuing signed languages up to the level that others are. We need to do this carefully and respectfully. 
Now, equality of condition. This is the highest level, and this, of course, is my favorite. And in, uh, we are hoping that within our lifetimes, we see this come to pass. And it's the most ambitious and far-reaching uh, framework that you can see because it goes much beyond the other two, either basic or liberal egalitarianism. It's the total acceptance. It's that one tries to get a parity as close to true parity as possible. Excuse me, that, the interpreter is wrong. That was the liberal egalitarianism. With equality condition, it means that you can hope to aspire that someday you will actually garner this parity. If you look uh, children's labor rights before, um, which were nil, and children worked in the mines underground for hours and hours and hours. Finally, those laws changed and children received public education. There were child labor laws. And you can see that there are positive evolutions over time. You can see that this isn't a hopeless undertaking because there have been these great advances in human rights across the board that have applied to groups and to individuals. So it's not a pipe dream. It can happen. So you can, do you understand my framework of three levels? I mean, it's pretty easy to understand, right? Basic equality, liberal egalitarianism, and the hardest of all to reach, which is the equality of condition. And that's where the work, true work lies. I feel that uh, for the deaf experience of our experiences of oppression, how bitter we are, I get it. I totally understand it. Um, it's, it's easy to explain. Um, it's hard to imagine that this would ever be something that can be ameliorated. But my view is that it can, and equality of condition is the thing to which we should strive the most together. So there's several different bullet points under equality framework, right? If you look at the economics of the world, the way people work, the way they're able to garner a living, what have you, of course, there's disparity. And political context of inequality, you even know here in your own country, in the Congress, who's in the Congress, right? Older white guys, right? Older white men, they're the lawyers, they're the well-heeled, the people who are financially well-off and what have you. And uh, are they truly representative of American society? American society is incredibly diverse. Native Americans, African Americans, women, people with disabilities all across the board. Where are they represented in Congress? And you can see these examples in other countries as well, that the representation isn't true representation. Affective. Um, this is a really profound idea that I'll be going more into on Thursday when I give my talk, on Thursday evening. Um, this will be the subject of my talk. It's kind of complex and People might think, uh, does it mean love? Does it mean that kind of affection? Um, but if you think about like a mother with children, right? Okay? She takes care of her children, right? Uh, or maybe she adopts other children that aren't even her biological children, right? That's one way to look at affective. Um, you can't buy love, right? Love has to be something that you just have intrinsically within you. It's essential to your being. So it's a very interesting sort of uh, subject to delve into, and it doesn't necessarily deal with just that aspect. But be threatening uh, to look at those particular sensibilities when it, you were implying it to policies and the way uh, signed languages and deaf people are treated. Dimens of, dimensions of equality to look into also are respect and recognition, resources, love, care, and solidarity, care, Solidarity, the unity. I'm sorry, I think I'm jumping around here, but uh, power relations and the way people are represented, representation, and working and learning. That's another important aspect of equality and how it can be overlaid. Respect and recognition. I mean, there's a whole gamut of different things, and you know, you could talk about all of this for years and years, <laughs> not just uh, two hours. I mean, I had a six-year thesis to prove what I've been doing. Um, and now I'm trying to condense it to an hour and throw everything I've learned at you as fast as I can. But, uh, you know. And 
Now, I want to make a difference now. I'm not talking about acceptance. Some people say, oh, no, sign it as acceptance. But there's a, there's a heavy meaning that underlays, underlies the word toleration. Tolerating something means, well, fine. It's interesting. It ain't what I would do when I go home behind closed doors. Oh, boy, that isn't something I'll ever engage in or approve of. But it's the attitude that, that you would show to the world but not necessarily harbor in your heart. And public and private distinctions, which is what I just talked about. In, de in terms of domestic violence, if I'm signing that correctly, domestic violence, uh, you know, it used to be that police would not intervene in a family domestic matter. But now times has changed, thankfully, and the police can go in and stop a per perpetrator's violence upon another family member, whereas before they wouldn't. That's changed. Before, it was just sort of uh, b uh, pretended ignorance. Why is that? Because the private domain and the public sector were considered completely impermeable at the time, whereas now the laws are in place to make that change. Equality condition. Now, this is where we have some of the similar aspects from the previous one, but they go beyond. Universal citizenship and acceptance. Acceptance meaning a celebration, not tolerance. Not we'll just put up with it, but a celebration, a recognition, and uh, that when you're home behind closed doors, what you feel is the same as what you go out and show your neighbor every day. You know, the family is a very important unit, unit, and what children see their parents do has a strong influence upon them. It's ingrained and shapes them. And so when these things are demonstrated in the home, acceptance uh, and tolerance or intolerance is not accepted. That leads to more celebration across the board for all peoples. Just as I was saying with domestic violence, the, it, the example that I used and how that has changed over the years. Boy, and I could go on and on and just describe this even further when we get into a, a critical dialogue about it. What I want to say is about this, that we can respect differences on a superficial level, but it's more important rather than even just respecting and saying you accept it is to engage in critical dialogue with people about those cultural differences. Hearing people will not change unless there are substantive discussions that take place. Critical dialogue because only through that way can people understand each other. And it's not a way to demean other people or in any way debase their opinions. It's a way to engage and open those doors of acceptance and the windows in people's minds so that they're able to understand better why the acceptance should be given and why opinions should be honored for each other. It's a symbiosis. And that way, the fear can be overcome. And people won't be so afraid that they're looked on askance by other people for having the wrong opinion. That doesn't lead to critical dialogue. That doesn't lead to the opening of those doors. And so basically, those are, it's, some people say this could only happen when you get to heaven, but I feel that this is something that can happen very much here on earth. And that if you take this framework and you apply it to sign, signed languages and signing people, that you get what's in the final column here. This is really important to see at the level of basic equality, a recognition of the rights of individuals, uh, as sort of a pat on the head, but as far as winning a court case, uh, it wouldn't extend quite to that uh, level. And um, sign language is fine as long as it does not supersede spoken language. So as long as it's in its place as inferior to a spoken language, then it's accepted. And also the fact that uh, resources are meted out uh, very carefully, not flowing freely. However, with the liberal egalitarians, we see a recognition in law of named sign languages. And we see uh, provisions but 
they are distributed depending on the goodwill and the discretion of official bureaucracy. And so this allows room for uh, using the excuse of reasonable accommodation um, and the judicious use of funds for certain purposes. And it, it allows uh, people in positions of leadership to say, well, uh, we can only give you so much, but after that we, we, we have budget constraints. So you can see, obviously, equality of condition. We have very different circumstances. We have recognition and celebration of named sign languages, and there's no ambivalence toward them to different languages or cultures, that uh, that is gone, and that there is simply a recognition and celebration, and I, not in a sort of a radical, revolutionary way, um, but but in a way where people learn about each other's cultures and lives and languages, and there's a sharing. And also in terms of resource, resources, resources are given as a right rather than based on need. In the liberal egalitarian level, uh, they, resources are granted sort of uh, very, very carefully based on need. But there's no discussion of, uh, of the need to prove that the resources should be spent at the equality of condition level. Um, countries all over the world have uh, don't are not at this level legislatively yet. We're more at the level of the liberal egalitarian equality, uh, like Sweden uh, is an example. Um, and where would you put America in this? Mm, probably in the liberal egalitarian. I don't know. You think America has achieved equality of condition? Uh, yeah, but uh, you're being answered in the audience that we're not quite there yet. So, obviously we have some discussion about that. Sorry, I, 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 I don't see that. I don't see that as happening. And, uh, you know, my friends in America also are telling me uh, that we're not there yet. But it's really important to understand this framework of equality, these levels of equality. If we use this framework uh, of equality of condition, then we can come to understand that the right to sign language needs to be uh, recognized legislatively, and we need to go back and make changes to our laws. And we need to make people aware, and, and it's a process, uh, and that we need to uh, change our language policies, and we need to conduct educational campaigns about uh, the fact that uh, the right to use a language just should be an in inherent right. So we need to shift public attitudes as well. And it's most important to emphasize respect and recognition for signed languages. All right, now I'm trying to summarize all of these concepts in one, in one slide here. Now this book was written, uh, I'm not sure if it's 2004. Yeah, 2004. Uh, so this book was written in 2004. And Patty Ladd, uh, book, his book on deafhood was written in 2003. And these two things sort of came together at the perfect time for me to help me um, apply this framework, uh, these two critical uh, themes, equality of condition and deafhood, and, and see how the two things just, um, just match beautifully. And um, so this, this slide looks at uh, the levels of equality and how they relate to different views of deafness. And we know that the medical model sees deafness as you know, hearing that isn't working that needs to be fixed. And uh, the social uh, view of deafness uh, 
believes that there should be support of deaf people, perhaps not to the extent of actually calling them rights, but, but uh, believes that caretaking of deaf people is necessary. But deafhood, uh, in terms of the levels of equality, deafhood uh, takes a look at all the different structures, cultural, economic, political structures that have oppressed uh, deaf people for so long. And the perspective of deafhood says that it's not the fault of the individual or the community, it's the fault of the system. And uh, this book about deafhood just it was so enlightening for me. I, I read it and I saw the, the, how it could relate to EOC and I just thought this is perfect. Deafhood is about the celebration of community and language. Deafhood um, incorporates an attitude of respect both towards the self and towards others and towards different sign languages uh, and uh, towards different different political systems, uh, so I, so it, the, the concept of deafhood puts language in the forefront as well in terms of, of, of deaf rights and so forth, and totally discards the framework of disability, but uh, sees deafness and the deaf community in a completely different light. And I believe that this framework of deafhood will re-energize deaf communities who have been long been victims of, of, of oppression and, and will inspire them to come together and uh, what would be the sign for flourish in a state of equality?